Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome the few that are here on this holiday weekend. I would also like to welcome Reverend John Eamon as our pastor today, taking uh, Karen's place while she and her family have been on vacation. Um, John, as I'm sure most of you know, but maybe not, was the chaplain at Presbyterian Hospital for many, many years. And I just heard that he retired this past summer after many years of being the chaplain there um, and doing a wonderful job. That is my alma mater. That's where I went to nursing school. So it has a special place in my heart and I'm sure a special place in John's heart too. So we're very glad that he could come with us today. I don't know if there's any, I don't know of anyone who's in the hospital or ill right now. Um, are there any other announcements that we need to be aware of? Mac, do you have anything? Okay, John, you're okay? All right. Um, then without further ado, let's move on to the call to worship. And if you can rise as you're able and read responsibly with me. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come, let us worship God. The opening hymn this morning is in your bulletin as morning dawns. Please join me in the opening prayer. O God of all creation, you alone are God, and you alone can satisfy our longing for a support that earth cannot give and that heaven cannot take away. 
Help us in recognition of our common dependence on you to acknowledge our need for one another. Let the oneness of our worship make us one in love and service. Amen. Please be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Let us pray together the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. God of grace, love, and communion, 
We confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us, forgive our sin, and raise us to new life that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free by the generous grace of God. Share the good news in the way that you live with each other. Thanks be to God. be seated. We read in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us bring forth our tithes and offerings.
Loving God, we bring forth this offering in light of our many gifts and dedicate it to the work of your gospel. We ask your blessing upon it and upon all that we do as we seek to respond to your grace and the opportunity of our lives of faith. Amen. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's first scripture reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Micah. I'm going to admit right here and now, I don't remember there being a book of Micah. Uh, I used to know all the books of the Bible, and this was one that came as new to me. I'm starting at verse 6, going through verse 8. It's on page 816 in your pew Bibles. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Thanks be to God for his words of wisdom. Our New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 1 through 10 may be found in the Pew Bibles on page 77 of the New Testament. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be a guest at one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Here is the reading. Thanks be to God. I was watching a repeat of an old talk show recently and the guest was Orson Bean. Perhaps some of you remember him. He was an actor and comedian with a career stretching seven decades. And especially from the 60s to the 80s, he was a regular presence on all manner of TV programs. Well, in the talk show interview, he told of how he got his name. He was born with the name of Dallas Burroughs and he began his career as a comedian using that name. But working early on in a little club in Boston, uh, there was a problem in that no one laughed at his jokes, except the piano player. The piano player thought he was hilarious. So that piano player told him that the problem was with his name. And every night, the piano player would suggest to him a different name to use. There was Hornsby Shirtwaist and Roger Duck, but still no laughs. Then one night the piano player suggested Orson Bean, and there happened to be some laughs from the audience, and that was that. 
He was there after Orson Bean. And I thought to myself, that's got to be one of the most frivolous approaches to receiving a name I've ever heard. That's even more arbitrary than all the show business stories that you hear about people being assigned a new name by their agent or a producer. Still, it's an interesting story. The question, how did you get your name, almost always yields an interesting story, in part because it's always a personal story. We could probably just go around the room here this morning and everybody say how they got their names and it would be a fascinating time. Whether your name was thought up on the spur of the moment when you were born or whether it's part of some long family tradition, the story itself would be intriguing because it would be so personal. I was named after my two grandfathers, uh, John Ferrix Rudolph and Frank William Eamon. I ended up with a combination of John and William, but I've often thought that I could have easily gone through life as Frank Ferrix. I wasn't that because I already had a brother named Frank. He was named after our father, Frank Carney Eamon. He had been named after his father, Frank, along with the physician that had delivered him, Dr. Carney, which was apparently a bit of a tradition in the rural South. My mother's original middle name was Vernon, and she detested that, tried to keep it secret. She had been given that name because her mother loved the book Dorothy Vernon of Haddon Hall. Now why her mother chose Vernon out of that instead of Dorothy was always a mystery, but there you go. And on and on and on go the backstories of our names. I knew a man whose given name was General. And so when he joined the army in World War II, he became Private General Owen. And that got him in trouble with some officers who thought they were, he was having fun with them. Some people have names that were given to them specifically for the purpose of distinguishing them with honor. I've met people named President, Doctor, and even Honorable. When I was growing up, it seemed to me that every third boy was named John, in part because of the popularity of both the name from President John Kennedy and astronaut John Glenn, both of whom brought contemporary esteem to a name that already had honorific biblical roots. But now, let's consider the name Zacchaeus. Is that an honorific biblical name in your mind? Have you ever met anyone named Zacchaeus? It's not a common name. While there are many people named Zach, that's usually short for Zachary or Zacharias. Sometimes it's just, it's just Zach itself, short for anything. It's curious that I've, I found that in census data, the, the only concentration of people named Zacchaeus comes from my home state of Alabama, um, though I've never met a Zacchaeus in Alabama that I knew of. My initial awareness of the name came only from the Bible, and I first knew it only from the story of Zacchaeus as represented in a children's song that we sang in Sunday school. Maybe some of you sang that in Sunday school. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Ring any bells? Zacchaeus is an interesting sounding name, and as a kid myself, it caught my attention and I wondered how he'd gotten that name. Etymologically, it's tied to the Hebrew word for pure, so it likely came to him by his parents with that sort of honorable association in mind. However, all we really know about his name is the meaning that he gave it through his life. We don't know the story of how he received the name, we only know the story of how his actions gave meaning as we think of him today. And really, isn't how we give our names meaning the thing that is most important in the end anyway? If we went around the room here, and instead of asking, how did you get your name, instead we ask, what meaning have you tried to give your name? That would be a far richer and more involved and more personal exercise. The name Zacchaeus came to mean a lot to me in spite of this appearance in the Bible being quite brief, but there's a good bit packed into the story that begins with just two basic descriptions of him, that he was a tax collector with money and he was short. 
But he turns out to be much more than that, in my opinion. And I want to think with you for a minute this morning about Zacchaeus, the person and the name, and what Zacchaeus may mean for us today. He suddenly appears in Scripture, as unexpected as if we just looked up in a tree and saw a guy. He comes out of nowhere. Though Jesus is not depicted as particularly surprised by him, calling him by name. The crowd also knows him and is disdainful of him. They know him as a tax collector and they call him a sinner. No doubt Zacchaeus was used to such disdainfulness and the people in every way looking down on him. But was he really a bad man? Well, tax collectors in the ancient world were certainly not popular, and many were surely corrupt. Nevertheless, there is nothing in this story that specifically condemns Zacchaeus apart from the opinion of the crowd and the implication of the fact that he was rich. Just a little earlier in the Gospel of Luke, there's a story of a man who was, quote, exceedingly rich, who came to Jesus, and Jesus was pretty hard on him. But... Zacchaeus is only said to be rich, affluent perhaps, possibly no more than we would recognize in our society as maybe a little questionable, but not exceedingly grandiose. Zacchaeus does make a reference to abuse of power and defrauding people, but that isn't necessarily an admission of guilt. He mentions it specifically as a conditional statement, if I have defrauded anyone of anything. So it could indicate his desire to explore, investigate whether he had, in fact, done this. I believe that if the story was fundamentally about Zacchaeus being a bad man, it would include a more explicit reference to his crimes or some more explicit mention of Jesus admonishing him. Jesus never chimes in to bolster the crowd's labeling of Zacchaeus, and while the story ends with Jesus referring to the lost, That's hardly a crime, more like a basic description of all humanity that could apply to the crowd as much as to Zacchaeus. Might it be that, just like today, there could have been good tax collectors, dedicated civil servants who did a job that was unpopular yet essential for governmental functioning? And wouldn't it be reasonable to think that a chief government employee might make a fine living? Isn't it possible that Zacchaeus could be, in keeping with the Hebrew meaning of his name, a relatively pure individual by normal standards, a professional whose duty was simply often unwelcome? I once knew a wonderful Presbyterian elder who was an IRS agent, and she told me that she didn't tell most people what she did for a living because she didn't want to evoke in them the potentially negative reactions that may come from that. Alas, Zacchaeus was known to be a tax collector, and it's likely that for most of the people in the city, that was enough said. For my part, I've always wanted to give him the benefit of a doubt. If Zacchaeus was already socially unpopular, though, it was quite a bold move to do something that might draw attention to himself, like climb a tree. I mean, it's sort of outlandish for an adult, and it put him literally out on a limb above an unfriendly crowd. But climb a tree he did just to see, apparently just to see. Zacchaeus doesn't appear to have wanted to draw Jesus' attention. He doesn't call to Jesus. He was out on a limb just to see him. He doesn't seem to have wanted anything from Jesus like a healing of an affliction or absolution of a transgression. And there is reason to suspect that he was quite surprised when Jesus suddenly called to him. I can imagine his stunned facial expression when Jesus calls to him by name, and the surprises just keep on rolling for Zacchaeus. When he comes down, Jesus invites himself over to stay at Zacchaeus' house for the night. Can you imagine a fleeting thought in Zacchaeus' mind? Oh, the place is a mess, but what am I going to say? No. If Zacchaeus was married, I wonder if he flashed a thought about, you know, coming home. Hi, honey. Look who I brought home. It's the Lord. But the story doesn't suggest that Zacchaeus hesitated in any way. He's all in. The Greek text is a little ambiguous about what 
happens next in terms of where the exchange between Zacchaeus and Jesus occurs. Maybe it's right there in the street, or maybe it's a little later at the house. I prefer to think it's at the house or near the house. What is significant is how Zacchaeus responds to Jesus on his own. He says, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. He responds without being prompted by Jesus, and he does so with two commitments. He will give a large portion of his wealth to the poor, and if, if he has defrauded anybody, then he will pay a very generous compensation. The story throughout is one where Jesus is shown to be quite respectful of Zacchaeus. They have a remarkably sort of gentle, even maybe sweet interaction. Zacchaeus may be lost, to use Jesus' words, but the simple encounter with Jesus was enough to recalibrate Zacchaeus' inner compass on how to live his life. And then at this point, Zacchaeus disappears as quickly as he appeared. And we don't hear of him again. In the context of the gospel, according to Luke, this story is one of a number that illustrates Jesus walking about, revealing more and more of his divine nature and purpose. In that way, this story is another one about Jesus paying attention to someone who was looked down upon by others and about his mission that the lost shall be noticed and found and transformed. Nevertheless, this is also a story about a particular man, a guy who I think represents a relatable and sound model for discipleship. Zacchaeus has always meant a lot to me for that reason. His name has come to represent three things to me that for me are some basic guides to Christian life. The first thing that I associate with Zacchaeus is that he sought to get a good look at Jesus. As I mentioned before, he seems only to want to see Jesus clearly, and he was willing to go to some lengths to accomplish this. This has been for me a guiding principle. I should be willing to go to some lengths to try to see Jesus more clearly. It's why I undertook study of the Bible and theology, trusting that scripture would give me a better view of Jesus. It's why I sought to learn Greek and Hebrew and be able to read the original text as much as I could from the earliest possible sources. I believe Presbyterians on the right, Presbyterianism is on the right track when it comes to emphasis on ancient language study. The desire to see Jesus more clearly is also behind my prayer and meditation practice, which I believe grounds and supports my understanding and discernment and spiritual connection. And my desire to see Jesus more clearly is what inspires me to look into the faces of others, especially the faces of the sick and the outcasts, and the hope to glimpse there something that could make Jesus more visible to me. Zacchaeus challenges me personally to try to see Jesus without obstacles and without the motivation of wanting something particular from him. I can always ask, but do I always have to be asking? The second thing that I associate with Zacchaeus is that he was quick to respond to Jesus when he heard him call. It's one thing to try to get a better look at Jesus, and it's quite another to respond to the Lord's call. Who? Me? I was really just looking. Well, Zacchaeus might have had cause to worry about being called out from his perch in the tree, unsure about what he was getting into. But he hurried down, and before you know it, he's welcoming the self-invited Jesus into his home into the symbolic and real center of his life. No hesitation. Now, maybe he was starstruck to have a celebrity take an interest in him, but I believe this response was more heartfelt. In this way, Zacchaeus challenges me to be truly open to Jesus' call, including the call to welcome him into the center of my life. What am I getting into if I do this? I honestly don't know at any one moment. And there's a strong human desire to be cautious and to keep a little distance to someone or something that could get complicated. Being out on a limb of a tree might be precarious, but it's at least observation from a safe distance. The fact that Zacchaeus hurried down from the tree showed that to him the whole Jesus thing was more than a spectator sport. 
His response showed faithfulness and openness to whatever was next with Jesus. I have tried to have faith to say to the Lord, okay, sure, I'm in, let's go. But at times, I'll admit, a high limb might feel safer. Who wouldn't want to hear Jesus say, come here, let's hang out at your place. In theory, that seems fabulous, but in the real world, it could be a little unsettling. And the third thing that I associate with Zacchaeus is that he was inspired by Jesus to reevaluate his life with a sense of concern for others and to take action. He doesn't respond to Jesus by saying, oh Lord, forgive me of my transgressions, wash away my sins, save me. He says essentially, you know, here's what I think I'll do. I'll give new focus on others and on doing things that contribute to justice and right relationship. In seeing Jesus so up close and personal, Zacchaeus seems to have been able to see himself more clearly and also to see more clearly the best path for head for his life. He seems to have come to recognize and attend to his lostness in the presence of the one who came to seek out and to save the lost. And while his plan was ambitious, it's within the realm of possibility and relatability. And I'd note that it's considerably more modest compared to what Jesus asked of others with regard to the disposition of material wealth. But think about it, if he did follow through on this plan, and there's no reason to think that he didn't, he would have made a real difference in many people's lives. I wish the story of Zacchaeus said a little more. And I wonder if he stayed a civil servant as a tax collector. Though maybe even one with a new reputation among the crowd as a person of integrity and concern for the poor. I wonder how he further discerned his path of life through this encounter with Jesus. And I wonder what else he did after Jesus left his house. I wonder what his name came to mean to the very crowd that dismissed him as a sinner. I like to think that he continued to examine his life and to turn that examination into ever new actions. So when I hear the name Zacchaeus, I immediately think of a person who tried to see Jesus clearly, responded to Jesus and welcomed him into the center of his life and who examined himself in light of this encounter with the divine and sought a course correction in the direction of his life, a course correction that steered him to just action considerate of others, especially the needy. That's what he represents to me. That's what his name brings to my mind. I do not know how he got his name, but I know most importantly what he gave to his name. What his name means to me sets challenging goals for my life, to seek to see Jesus clearly, to welcome Jesus to the center of my life, to take action from self-examination. These are guiding principles to me and they have roots in the story of Zacchaeus as much as anywhere else in scripture. I have to ask myself though, whether anyone would actually associate such things with me or whether my name would bring such things to their mind. Put another way, more broadly, have I given my name more meaning than the meaning of the story of how I got my name? And does that meaning somehow bespeak my discipleship as a Christian? That is for me always an open question and is one that I take seriously and humbly. It's a worthwhile question. How we get our names is interesting, but the meaning that we give our names as labels for our lives is most important and is always open to our shaping of that meaning. What I pose for us this morning, in light of the story, using the story as a kind of lens, is a question that I would suggest for contemplation through two constituent challenges. First, consider how you personally relate to the, to the Zacchaeus story and to see things from his side and connect to what he did. This could be a good starting point. And second, how do you try to give your name meaning, especially as a Christian? Or in other words, does your name, as shorthand for your life, bespeak your faith? Jesus is calling to us, as he did to Zacchaeus, 
And he is saying not just come on down, but let me in. Jesus is calling us by name. How do we respond with the wholeness of our lives? How do we respond by name? Amen. Let us affirm our faith together using the Apostles' Creed printed in the bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our preparation hymn is Take My Life in the insert in the bulletin.
Please be seated. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were open and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all who will trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Living with you, he prays for us. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith. Encourage us with hope. Inspire us to love that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. We praise you, eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your word made flesh, and the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes, the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament you have given your Son, who is the true bread from heaven, and food for eternal life. So strengthen us in your service that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now offer prayers, and I ask, are there any particular concerns or joys to be lifted up this morning? Concerns? Yes, please. Thank you. 
Other concerns? Well, let us pray. Lord of love, hear these our prayers of thanksgiving and petition, which we wrap together in the mix of life. We are filled with concerns and have joys and lift the fullness of what is on our hearts and minds to you, knowing that in you we are heard. We pray as your children who seek comfort and understanding, guidance and healing. We pray with a sense of duty and wonder, but also of brokenness and suffering. We pray for your church and for the world, for ourselves and our families, and for all whom you call us to claim as brothers and sisters and to love as our neighbors. We lift up in prayer this morning, especially Linda in her recovery, that she find each day an encouragement and a sign of progress. And we pray for Anthony dealing with lung cancer, that in the midst of such a complicated and stressful time, he find all the help around him in the ways of medicine, in the ways of family, love, and faith. Lord of mercy, in whom we will always find our way, hear us, help us, and hold us in your blessing. Amen. And let us pray now together the prayer that our Lord has taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, Come Live in the Light, is found in the bulletin.
now let us go in the love of God. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Let us go in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Peace of the Lord be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>